So this is my natural place, standing in front of people and, and yapping at them. So if I, I get too talkative and, and, uh, and not listening to you, please let me know. Right, so in this little session, and I um, want to really thank you for the opportunity to have a quick chat with you. I think it's always good fun to, to talk to other people and get you know, the sharing of ideas. But we want to talk about a well, basic little story about talk about six simple rules of product management. Now, because I haven't plugged it in, I haven't turned it on, aha, uh -huh, power switch, that'll do it. Um, so, as we were just being introduced, um, we're from, it's about Sean and I from Brainmates, we're a product management training and consulting business. And why we think that's important is because we train what we do and we do what we train. And so if it doesn't work in the real world, we change it so that it works in the real world. And, excuse me, um, what we've done over the years is we found really good ways that make a lot of sense but don't work in the real world. And we've continually optimised them so that we can use them practically and that becomes part of our core training course. <coughs> um, my name is Nick Costa. I'm one of the co-founders of BrainMates, along with Adrian Tan. Uh, we've been doing this BrainMates thing for over 11 years now, so being professional product managers, uh, trainers and consultants in that space. And together we've both had uh, over 20 years of product management experience um, in the telecommunications, new media, and you name it, we've been able to apply the product management thinking to a wide range of different industries and services. Okay, so today's topic, and this actually came from a conversation we had, so I gave a presentation earlier today, and we were asked to do a bit of a talk on the topic of how can we bring ideation quickly to market and meet the customer's expectation of the product. And so I've kind of used this as a starting point to talk about the six simple rules because it's not unusual for people to say, hey, I've got these great ideas, how do I get them to market, and then make sure the customers like them. And so we'll kind of use what we're referring to as our six simple rules to sort of restate this question in a way that's actually more practical and useful for any business to think about. Okay, so to answer this, we use our six simple rules. And the idea of having six simple rules is that um, it's easy to make two complicated rules, or lots of complicated rules, they have a big methodology. And when we sat down and thought in terms of the, the product management space, the, the practices in product management are changing. And there's lots of different sort of competing or almost overlapping methodologies that are being applied. So old school is waterfall, where you came up with an idea, you'd flesh it out, you'd write a requirements document, you'd build another requirements document to meet the other requirements document, you'd hand it over to the development team, they'd build it out, you'd launch it and realise that three years ago it was already out of date. And so that didn't seem to work very well. And so new methodologies like Agile and Lean and customer centred design and service design are sort of popping up in all directions. <coughs> really over the last 10, 15 years they're sort of becoming more fashionable but they're trying to do the same things in slightly different ways. And so when we look at these, it's easy to get down in the, in the, um, in the detail of if you're doing Agile, are you doing Scrum, what type of Scrum, are you doing Kanban, and get all, into all this sort of deep terminology. But if people want to adopt it quickly, we want it to have simple rules that kind of covered all the bases, regardless of what methodology we're talking about, that enables you to understand or kind of frame that thinking um, no matter what kind of process or method you're using to do stuff. So these six simple rules are essentially shortcut strategies so that we can remember them and implement change in organisation very, very quickly. So here are our six simple rules. First rule, customer first. Now it's a sort of rule that everyone goes, yes, customer first, we value the customer, they're wonderful, and then we go up and build some stuff and realise the customer doesn't want it. <coughs> so when we mean customer first, we mean before we have any conversation about the product, we should know who our customer is, we should have met them, we should have had a conversation with them, really understood what their pain points or frustrations or, or needs are as part of that discussion. Um, if we don't start with the customer, then everything is broken everywhere beyond that. But the way we treat things is kind of like, we've given you the product and the customer goes, oh, I love you so much, you're the most fantastic company in the whole wide world, let me, you, I wish you riches and happiness forever. But that's not how customers are. Customers couldn't give a crap about us. We give them something, they pay us the money, and they leave. So we'll get rid of this. The big problem is that customers are all different. 
And so every person is different. And so one of the challenges is that we need to try and work out um, the types of customers we're after. Because as businesses, we can't serve every single person exactly the same way. We need to look at um, different types of customers, group them into, into you know, uh, segments or to target markets that we've chosen to focus on at the expense of potentially others. And then we need to understand what are their pain points? What do they need from us? Because ultimately, if we create a product that nobody wants, we may have had fun doing it, but it's absolutely pointless. So we have to start with customers as our grounding, because if we don't know who our customers are, then everything else is a waste afterwards. So the first thing I wanted to do with this first statement is flip it around. So instead of saying, how can we bring ideation quickly to the market and then meet the customer expectation, well, how about we put our customer first? So now we'll say, how can we meet the customer's expectation by bringing an idea and a product to the market quickly? So suddenly the, the nature of that inquiry changes because it's not about a product first, it's now about a customer first. And we'll keep fiddling with this statement as we go through these six simple rules. <clears throat> Rule number two. And this is kind of the hard one. Now I'm a recovering mechanical engineer and I like building stuff like anyone else. But it's really hard sometimes to stop building stuff and start listening. And so this second rule is all about listening to a customer, or, and it could be an internal or an external customer, and listening enough to understand what pain point or frustration or problem are we actually trying to solve before we jump to a conclusion of how we can solve it. And sometimes the cleverer we are, the harder it is to do this, to make sure we don't jump to that immediate conclusion. So, oh, I know exactly what you mean. I can fix it for you. But we just have to listen to our customers. Because what we see is that most products fail, or of the products that do fail, and then fortunately there's a heck of a lot of them. Some of the main reasons for them is that the actual customer problem hasn't been considered well enough before the product was taken to market. Someone's come up with a cunning plan to build something, take it to market, and has gone to the market without really ever speaking to a customer and finding out why they wanted it. It's the whole story of a, a, a hammer in search of a nail. And we want to try and avoid that by baking in this thinking to always think about the customer problem before we think about the solution. And often, and I've just been speaking with telcos, uh, and I think this is an example that possibly comes from a telco, I'm just, just guessing. Uh, but the, what's really interesting with many customer problems in commoditized markets, which become harder and harder to compete in, is it's not actually the product that people are complaining about. People don't complain, oh, the product wasn't fast enough or, or good enough. It's usually, I had a small problem and it took me a week to get it resolved. Or I called somebody and they couldn't help me or wouldn't help me. Or there was a strange discrepancy in my bill and nobody could fix it. And so a lot of the things that happen to, to a product or to a customer's experience have very little to do with the product itself, the core thing that people are selling. So when we start thinking about customer problems, it's very easy to overfocus on the product that we're offering and forget about the customer experience that the customer has. So as we bring these, these two rules together, we need to understand who our customers are and then see our products through their eyes and understand what problems they might be having. So now if we ex extend on this statement again, <coughs> How can we meet the customer's expectation by bringing the idea, idea and the product quickly to market? Now we need to reframe this. How can we solve a customer problem um, by bringing ideation and, uh, and a product quickly to market? So again, we're sort of teasing out the fact that there's a problem to be solved. It's not just their, their, uh, what their expectations are. Their expectations are that you solve a problem. So let's state it like that. If, the, if we give a product to a customer and it doesn't solve a problem, well then, it won't meet your expectations. Our third rule, <coughs> excuse me, is leave the building. Now this is a concept that was made quite popular by Eric Rise in the Lean Startup book. People know the, the mantra, uh, for whether it's you know, Steve Blank from Four Steps to the Epiphany, or Eric Rees who, who talks about it as well. But this idea of leaving the building is the concept of you won't find the ideas inside. <coughs> You won't find customer problems 
by glaring out the window and hoping they'll, they'll be waving at you saying, I've got a problem, can you help me? You have to get outside and talk to people. And chances are when you actually go outside and talk to people and you try and find the customers we've been talking about, you'll learn stuff really, really quickly. You'll learn just how embarrassingly wrong you are. And as a result, that learning experience, once you get over the first couple, um, will clarify that you're in the, heading in the wrong direction. It'll clarify that you've just saved an enormous amount of time, money and resource by realising you were heading down the wrong direction by finding that early and cheap just by talking to a handful of customers. And so the idea of leaving the building is incredibly critical. But it's not just a new thing. It's not something that, that has just come out of, sort of the recent literature in the last few years. This is a concept that's been around for decades. And so sometimes people put you know, the hard word on traditional product management, but traditional product management came out of Procter & Gamble and brand management. And the whole idea of going out and meeting with your customer was established in the early 30s. So product management isn't something which is brand new and exciting. The concepts we're talking about here are fundamental and extend across generations, across products and brands, and across whatever particular methodology we're using to build the product as well. And so here's a, one of the tools that was used with Toyota, which is a Japanese term called Genchi Genbetsu, which stands for, or basically means, go and see for yourself. And this came out, I think it was around the, 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 the 50s. Well, the, and was sort of documented in the Toyota way. But what's interesting with this is that the, the approach for the uh, Toyota way was to get out of the building, except in the case of there, it wasn't get out of the building, it was getting the management team to go into the factory floor and observe what was going on. And it wasn't a case of just walking the floor. They actually painted a yellow circle on the factory floor with two footprints in it. They had to step into, take their position, and just watch. Watch and take notes. They couldn't say anything, they couldn't do anything, they just had to observe what was happening. And they, those observations of getting outside the building, talking to people, seeing what's going on, and actually getting to the place where things are happening is an incredibly powerful uh, experience to start learning from the coalface. And that's not always easy to do depending on the product or service that you're offering, but if we don't try, we won't find out. And sometimes you need to think of strategies of how do you find your customers and talk to them. But again, it's once you recognise this is something that you need to do, then the next challenge is you identify your own problem, you then go out and find a solution. Okay, so we need to go out and speak with customers. And again, looking at this, we want to solve the problem um, now by better understanding customers. So the act of going out and just seeing customers allows us to clarify kind of the crap that we put into our heads initially, which is I think there's a customer out there with this particular problem. Fabulous. That's a nice imagination that you've got there. Now let's go out and test it. And so the test of actually going out with a customer, or going out to it and seeing a customer, will validate or invalidate your idea and then send you packing back to come up with a new idea, more often than not. And that's still a good thing. Depressing sometimes, sometimes, but still a very good thing. So we start to understand our customers better, and invariably what happens when we go out and get ourselves kicked by the customer, we learn stuff, not just about what we got wrong, but other insights that we draw from those experiences. Okay, fourth one. Link our actions to strategic intent. Often when we're sort of down the coal face working on features or functionality, it's easy to lose sight of the bigger picture. Every organisation exists to deliver something usually to its shareholders or to its constituents, depending on what type of business it is. But ultimately, some, there is some strategic goal it's trying to achieve. And if we forget that what that strategic goal is, we can build cool stuff that doesn't help us achieve that goal. So what's really important is that if we, we firstly, to achieve those goals, we need to know what they are. If a business is bumbling along, a, either without a clear goal or strategic objectives, or without communicating them, it's almost impossible for the individuals within that team to be able to help achieve them. And the impact of that is that everyone's really busy, really carefully doing stuff that is often across purposes, and is slowing you down, and is creating more friction in the business than forward momentum. So if we know what the actual goals are, 
suddenly we can see that every effort we perform starts to move us in the same direction. Now, and this is the, the joke you were wondering about earlier, which is probably unique to me. Um, back when I was at university, I was the captain of the Chinese International Club Dragon Boat Racing Team. Long story. <laughs> I think there's a laugh, it's good. Um, essentially, one of the things I learned being, by being the Dragon Boat Team is that uh, if the t no matter what the strength of the team is, if the team isn't all pulling together in one single movement, the boat doesn't move forward. You lose the race. You've got more drag than you have forward momentum. But there's something amazing what, that happens when the, when the boat's moving in unison and everyone stands the oar in the water and pulls in exact unison. The boat doesn't just move forward, it surges forward. And you feel that movement as a physical thing when everyone's pulling together. And so whenever, from a business context, the same thing applies. If everyone has the same goals and the same objectives and knows what they're striving for and is focusing their attention on achieving them with everything they do, then suddenly you start to feel that surge in the business pulling you forward. Um, I was going to say something now, I forgot what it was. Doesn't matter. It's all good. Okay. So now we look at this statement again. If we build this out, we haven't really changed the intent of it, but we've changed the focus of it. So how can we better understand our customers' problems and solve it? But to achieve business goals by ideation and taking a product to market quickly. So we've linked in this business objective as an important aspect of what we're trying to achieve. That's what it was. Sometimes you can feel really busy during a day. You've cranked out 40 emails, you've, you've dealt with a few customer inquiries, you've done some busy stuff. But if it doesn't link back to the strategic intent of the business, you should be able to look back at that and go, huh, I just wasted a day. I was really busy, but I achieved nothing towards our strategic goals. And so it's, a, it's good to have that little voice in the back of your head saying, this thing that's urgent right now, is it worth it? Because we're all time poor, we're all crunched on time, we all have exactly the same amount of time in the day, and there's never enough of it. So if you want to help the business, help yourself and your careers, then it's valuable to always be thinking, is this helping our goals as a team? And if it's not, you say, you know what, it can wait. And it's probably not that important, and it's probably not important for the organisation you're working in. Okay. This one will be familiar with anyone who's worked in an agile team, and this is do uh, sorry do less more often. And it's the idea of essentially ch chunking things down into smaller and smaller pieces to create smaller achievable goals that you can then leapfrog and learn from. So I've also run a couple of marathons, and not recently I'll have to say, uh, but the only way to run a marathon is one step at a time. You can't start and then finish and just with one great leap. It'd be handy, but it doesn't work that way. It's hard work to achieve a long-term goal. And a marathon's a good example of one that you can't just stumble up and turn up on the day and expect to finish it. So a big project is a bit like a marathon. You have to think, what are the individual steps we have to take? We have to take a lot of them. And also, what are the, what are the individual milestones, or the smaller milestones that we can kind of celebrate? So it might be passing the 5K mark, it might be getting to the halfway mark. It might be things that we've achieved along the way that we can measure and see if we're on the right track. Now certainly, the longer the project, the, the more important the milestone. And one of the things as, as, a, as a runner I would do is, particularly in the last 30K, um, or after the 30K mark, would be look, that tree over there. Just going to get to that tree. Then that billboard then that bus stop, then whatever was about 30 metres ahead of me, just to get those little wins with each time it got a little bit harder. And the same thing applies for the training for it. You don't turn up the day before a marathon and run a marathon expect to survive the, the following week. You'd be wrecked. To train for a marathon to get better at it, you do a little bit on a regular basis more often. Okay? You don't run the marathon every week to practice for a marathon. You do a little bit all the time. And so the, the principles of Agile in particular are to try and take a bigger project and chunk it down into discrete chunks or discrete deliverables that are delivering value to the customer or the market in regular chunks more often. 
And so this concept doesn't have to just apply to Agile, it can apply to anything. It can apply to thinking about the writing of a business case, or a development plan, or anything you want to do. It's about trying to identify what are the smaller goals that if we achieve them, are going to deliver more value. Because if we pick smaller goals, they're easier to achieve. What's the goal you achieve today? What's the goal you're going to achieve this week? Because if we don't set a goal for this week or this day, then we're guaranteed not to hit it. It's quite a useful way of thinking about these smaller incremental steps that collectively build towards these larger goals. The other thing that's good, and this kind of combines back to the leave the building one, is that if we start doing things and doing market testing more frequently, it means that we can make smaller bets but do them more frequently and learn quickly because it reduces our risk. One of the big problems with a large waterfall or traditional type project to take a product to market is that you're putting all your eggs in one basket. You're only doing a market test once, which is maybe just before or just after you've actually launched the product. One of the benefits of, of an agile type environment is that you're trying to create opportunities to test the market more frequently, to make smaller bets with your most horrifying, scary assumption that you've made that the only way to test it is to make something and put it in front of a customer. And if we're not doing that, no matter what we call the methodology, it's, it's neither agile nor useful. We're simply putting all our eggs in one basket and hoping for the best. So making smaller bets that we can learn from and doing it more frequently means that we can course correct as we go along. The learnings that we get can bring us back to uh, bring us back on course based on what we expect to be successful in the marketplace. So again, looking at our original statement. How can we better understand our customer's problem and solve it to achieve business goals by using small, regular experiments to release a product quickly to market? Okay, so we're kind of adding bits and pieces to this. But the point of the, of the small steps is to constantly test and experiment and try and remove the risk from things and we get the wins, and if we don't get a win, then even a loss or a failure or a learning is a win in its own right. Particularly if we're doing it small and the risk is pretty low of, a, of the outcome being detrimental to the organisation. And our last rule is show and tell. Which is once you've done something, tell people about it. And so with a, with a new product idea, if you want to find out whether the market likes it, you're going to have to show them at some point. Now that could be at the launch, which is pretty risky. It might be during a beta test of some sort, which is a little bit less risky. But the earlier we can start to show and tell our ideas and express them to the marketplace and express them to the customers we're targeting, the sooner we're going to find out that we're right or we're wrong. And again, that's valuable if we can do that course correction on a more frequent basis. So if we have experiments, there's no point having a thought experiment, that's a starting point, but ultimately we have to do the experiment. So we actually have to take our ideas out to the marketplace and test them. Whether it's testing a marketing proposition, whether it's testing a prototype, whether it's testing a fully blown product, or whether it's testing a technology, we can call it whatever we like. But ultimately we have to test our assumptions and try and find out whether they will pass or fail the, the test that we put forward for. The other thing is, once we've tested it, once we've actually shown it to the marketplace or, or experimented with it, we get to tell people about it. This is again one of the, sort of diving into, into Agile for a moment, one of the benefits of, of a Scrum process is you get the showcase. And the showcase is essentially embodying this idea of showing and telling people what you did, how you did it, whether it worked or not, and what you learned along the way. And it's that opportunity to share the, the celebration and the success. But in particular, it's the opportunity to communicate to someone more than just yourself what was learned along the way. And again, that brings together the team. It brings together that shared direction. Suddenly we've all learned something. We don't have to learn it individually. We can learn it now as a group. We can suddenly realize, hey, I had that problem as well, and you've got some information I didn't know you had. So creating opportunities for a show and tell and talking about stuff and celebrating both our wins and our, our losses because if we use them correctly, every loss is a learning experience. 
and every learning experience is actually a win in its own way, particularly if we've done it frequently with relatively low risk. Okay, so this idea of the, essentially now is, whoops, um, is we want to better understand our customers, uh, our customers' problems, solve it, to achieve our business goals using smaller, regular experiments to quickly test our product and get it to the marketplace. Anything we do doesn't matter until it has first contact with the marketplace. Once it's in the market, even as a test, we start to learn from it immediately. So kind of wrapping up this little uh, story, our six simple rules are customers first, problems before solutions, leave the building because we don't validate anything until we step outside, link our actions to our strategic intent, do less more often, and finally, show and tell. And apart from the first one, which is customer first, they're not really in any chronological order. They weave together and overlap quite a lot. But we find that by keeping these, this thinking in the back of your mind, um, no matter what activity you're performing and what part of the business you're in, these, I think, are really powerful, useful rules to follow to sometimes check ourselves, say, hang on a minute, Am I building something because it's cool? Yeah, because there's a customer problem I'm trying to solve. If I'm doing this, is it going to help move us forward? Or is it just some busy work that I feel compelled to do because someone asked me to do it? And so each one of these rules is useful to kind of just be a bit of a checkpoint. Not to massively change our behavior, but to sometimes redirect and create more value from the, from the work that we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so we've transitioned this kind of this starting question from how can we bring the ideation quickly to market to meet the customer expectation of the product to, which is really quite um, uh, business centric. Like we've got an idea, we know everything, why won't the customers like it? To let's understand our customers, let's listen to them, let's understand their problem, then we'll find a solution to it we'll make sure that solution satisfies the business objectives that we're trying to achieve. Otherwise, it's probably not that important. If there's anything we need to test, let's go and test it. Test it with the marketplace in a cheap, safe, or low risk experiment, and then be prepared to take that to the marketplace and tell people about it later on. That's my little, little summary of our, our six uh, simple rules for product management. So I'd like to Throw it to you guys and see if you have any questions. About the show and tell part, right? Yes. A lot of times you you can't tell your uh, tell about your product until your product is released to the market, right? So it's, you don't want to have the person to build it, or you know there are other implications the customer doesn't want to uh, spread that around. Mm -hmm. So how do you have to and then if that that big chunk is gone, how effective do you think the product is gonna be? Because we can't probably show and tell prior to the I think the, the, the fear of exposing your product to the market before anyone else sees it, I think is an overbuilt risk and ends up being a bit of an excuse not to expose it to, to, to the market. Now, it doesn't mean that you start putting banners and flags up saying we've got this idea and come on competitors, come and see what we're doing. You can still be quite discreet about it if you choose to be. But I think that if you look at the, the fear of a competitor following you and copying what you're doing, um, means that they have to catch up to you to where you are in the first place. It assumes they care about what you're doing um, and has part of their strategic intent to, to, to copy what you're doing. But more importantly, the, you need to trade that off against the risk of not knowing whether you're right. And so if you keep going saying, I don't want to show anyone, don't want to show anyone, don't, don't want to show anyone. And wait for the big bang launch, and then you go, ta-da! And nobody comes to your party. That's going to be a bigger cost, in most cases, than the risk that someone else in the marketplace going, that's cool, let's copy that. Yeah. Does that help? Okay. So I think if, if you can make smaller, so almost experiments, they're not necessarily about showing everything, but to try and find out what are the things you don't know about yet that you need to test and framing them in that, in that context. You're doing experiments, you're not doing market launches necessarily.
Yeah. Yeah. So Neil doesn't actually build products for the market. We build it for the market, but our customers, in other words, people who pay us, yes. uh, are companies who themselves need to launch the product. So framing the, the six rules in that context, um, our customer being <clears throat> another business since we're a consultancy, um, where does the project the product manager's role fit into into driving these six rules with that with that customer interaction? I think when in regardless of where it fits into the overall flow, when you when a product gets built, we need to know by we the entire business, even if it's an outsourced part of the business. We kind of trend this as the, the family or the end to end process of I've got an idea to it got launched. Whether that function is in house or external. The question of the, the, the asking of the question is who are we building this for? Now, if, if you're if you're given a, a, a brief and it says make this thing that goes ding, um, and I'm sure that's never happened just in that context before, um, then you should be questioning or challenging or trying to evoke the response of, look, I'd really like to know who your target customers are. So that I understand that when it goes ding, how is it going to please them? What are they trying to do when it goes ding? Should it go ding at all? What problem are we trying to solve with this? Because the way most people think is they, they think in terms of a solution. They, they incorporate their thinking of the customer and the problem. It's not they haven't thought about it, but it's become internalised. And it's often not expressed. So your client potentially might be coming up with an idea and by the time you get to it, it's a solution concept. Here, make this. Okay? And the thinking around the customer and the problem it's trying to solve is a couple of documents away. Okay? Or it's been scribbled on a, on a, on a napkin. Or it's just internalised in the, in the business, in the minds of the people in the business. So by asking these questions, they're kind of they're relatively non-confrontational. They're common sense questions that for anyone in that, that whole process should be asking the question or should say, look, before I can do this effectively, I need to know who we're building this for. What's your target market? Can you describe this person or persona to me so that we can do it? And what is the specific problem we're trying to solve? Because unfortunately, usually the people who come up with the, the, the big idea and describe it as a solution have no idea how to build solutions. They've got an idea which is valid in the marketplace. They've seen a pain point and they've imagined their solution to the problem, but they don't know how to express or don't even know what's possible in terms of other alternatives. So as part of that, that value chain creation within an organisation, I would say think about these rules and think about how you can extract the information that supports them as you're developing products and services for your clients and ultimately for, for their customers. Well, we were having a discussion yeah, before thanks. that um, you were saying something that actually defines NEO is that you don't just write a product that it's not to give you a statement of words. You try to understand the real reason why they're actually looking for the solution in the first place. And that's, that's a similar principle in here. It's easy for someone to give you a statement of words and treat you like a sweatshop or a body shop and you deliver on that. But what you've lost the opportunity to do is actually help the customer define the correct statement of work. If someone has deduced that's what the solution looks like, and perhaps the person who wrote that document is not skilled to do that. And often in those situations, something will be developed and you'll deliver on scope, and then they'll realise it doesn't actually quite work, and then they might creep it, or then they'll start again and start building it out. So you can add a lot of value by first helping them understand if they really scope the right kind of thing. They shouldn't really be thinking in terms of what's the solution look like. They should really only be articulating what their problem is, and then you can come up with a solution because you are the developers. But sometimes you need to guide your customer to do that because it's a very unnatural journey for someone to try and describe the problem they have. Normally, they like to describe the solution they think they need. Mm -hmm. And and Sean was saying the. It's actually the, the act of describing a customer problem is very specific and often to make it a valuable product, the problem has to be quite painful. It has to be quite uncomfortable in the customer's life. Otherwise, if it's not painful or uncomfortable, why would I spend money to get it resolved? If there's not some clearly articulated frustration like, oh, this drives me nuts, 
then why would I bother changing product to, to, to another alternative? I mean, the, the, the example that's kind of ringing in my head these days, and I've, is, and I've seen it in different, different countries already, is Uber. Uber, I think, is a really good example of a product that is solving the same problem but in a different way because it's, it's, it's tackled the key frustrations of getting a cab in a city. They haven't solved the cab problem, they haven't solved the traffic problem. You still get in a car with some stranger, you then ferry it around to the place you wanted to get to, you're still stuck in traffic watching the meter rack up. But that's not the problem they tried to solve. They tried to solve the problem of where the hell's the car? Where's the taxi? How do I hire it? Oh, what number do I call? Um, and it's kind of looked at those other problems outside the core problem of getting from point A to point B. And it's kind of like, if you think through the tick list of all the things that drive you crazy about getting a cab, and then look at the Uber product, you'll see cross on the taxi, cross on taxi, tick Uber, tick Uber, and that's how they're creating their product differentiation. It's not because they have better cars or more comfortable seats or nicer drivers. That's a little bit of it, but that's not their differentiator. Their differentiator is the, the pain points of frustrations that customers probably wouldn't even have said they didn't like about the taxi process because they're just putting up with it. And sometimes the process of understanding customer problems is kind of putting a bit of a, 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 a jabber into, into those, those customer frustrations and really exposing them and realising just how, how frustrated people can be with stuff they've learned to put up with in life. And so for, for a client to be able to articulate their customers' problems reflects a real deep understanding of their customers and their customers' problems that they probably don't have. So it can be a bit of a conflict sometimes. They say, tell me what your customer problems are. Well, they have to get a cab, don't they? And that might be all you get. And you have to dig deeper to try and find out why you think being a cab alternative is a much better, better option. Any other questions? or comments or discussion. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between working with uh, like an early stage startup versus a company like Intel or you know, Telco? Oh. Bigger organizations, like how that changes the way that you work? Um, well, I think they've both got their, their advantages and disadvantages. So in an early stage startup, um, everyone's got some skin in the game. Everyone's working in a small team and your ability to communicate with each other and like the Dragon Boat team, go like a team. But if you imagine a Dragon Boat, instead of having 20 people on it, has 2,000 people on it, and getting them all to work in unison, wow, that's a tougher problem to have. And so you end up with, with silos and people with sort of varying uh, KPIs that don't seem to marry up with other KPIs, and all of a sudden they're trying to do different things and go in different directions. So trying to have really clear goals that everybody shares, that is relevant to everybody in the business, becomes much, much harder. In a small organisation, you can say, see that number on the wall? We need to make that one number go up. Come on team, let's huddle around and make it happen. Um, so that's certainly one aspect. Another aspect is that when you have a, a larger organisation, you don't just have one product, you actually have a pipeline of products that are in different stages of maturity, decline and, and introduction to the marketplace. Usually in an, in an early stage uh, startup organisation, you've got just one product that you're trying to get firstly out the door, then you're trying to get product market fit, then you're trying to get growth of that product. And you have the opportunity to be quite focused on it um, to do that. It doesn't make it easy, but you've got all your attention focused on just that one thing. I think that's probably some of the, some of the key differences. Plus you don't have, you've got far less bureaucracy and red tape. And if if something is not working in a small small team, it's up to the team to fix it. If something's not working in a large organisation, it requires a very bold person to swim upstream and say, stop, this is bollocks, it doesn't work, and we need to change it. And that's not really the case in a small team. So what are the advantages of the larger things? You said both have their advantages and disadvantages? Oh. Uh, between a large organisation and a small? Yep. Yep. Well, one of the advantages is if you make a mistake, you survive. And so the people who are in those roles 
are probably don't need to be as motivated. It doesn't mean they're not motivated. But if things go wrong and a product doesn't turn out the way they want it to, it's like, eh, whatever. And so they can get lazy, particularly if there's a, the organisation's doing pretty well. And this is where you can see organisations like Kodak or Nokia that have been chugging along, doing really, really well for a long time. And then suddenly the market moves. There's a disruptor. Technology and, the, the, and customers suddenly start doing something completely different and they don't change their directory. They're too slow to move to either preempt those things and they die. And it can happen to any size organisation because those organisations can get lazy in terms of their desire to change with the marketplace. But, I mean, that's obviously two examples which are a disadvantage. The larger organisations, they have fat. They can survive a couple of body blows if they, if they, can, if they can take it. And it means from a, from, a, from a quality of life perspective, some of the employers really like that. Um, but then they have to deal with the soloing, the backfighting, <laughs> the politics. So there's, that's it. there's different, different sides to each one. <laughs> it's an interesting um, like conflict we have like with because we work with startups and also larger companies. I guess larger companies will have more money, but then they're more adverse sometimes to the approach of testing and getting out of the building because they have this big vision that justified internally and it's gone through all these different departments and stuff. All right, that's it. We've got funding. Sorry, just build it. We don't want to like do any validation or testing or yep. anything. Smaller like startups, a five-person team or something, um, they want to minimise risk, but they're much more budget conscious. Yep. So they don't. I mean, they see the value in it, but they just don't have the money to spend on it. Right? Because I mean, we're consultants. We work time and materials, and um, you know, if, if you just gave me a question, do you want to build software or do you want to test whether you're doing the right software? We can say build software because mm -hmm. they're so certain there, right? Um, and part of what we do is try and diplomatically uh, alert them to the fact that maybe it's not the right approach, um, but we also don't necessarily want to talk ourselves out of business too. So it's like this really like conflicting sort of viewpoint on, um, well, you know, maybe maybe the maybe you say maybe the market. Or right, maybe you maybe you need to find a market that is big enough to be able to afford the value you offer, but it's also got a, a better cultural alignment. So you, you gave an example there, which sounded to me like there's a cultural mismatch, and I think it's easy to just clump all large enterprises in the same. Okay, yeah. so they're all kind of cheap and they don't really want to be innovative. I don't think that's true. I think mean, there's still plenty of newer, more successful organisations who have become quite large and have a tolerance for more agile approach approaches to, to developing things. Maybe it might help your business development in pipeline activity to try and see if there's a way to assess some kind of fine grain detail or a fine grain way of segmenting that market so that you can better seek out those organisations that align with your goals. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. I think also in, in both cases, there's, it, it's easy to just look at this as one business behaving one way, another business behaving another way. But they're not businesses, they're a bunch of people. And people are screwed up and scared at the best of times. And so in a large organisation, someone who's just been through three different sign-offs just to get you employed, just to get a, a, a deal signed with you. And then you say, oh, by the way, could we test this, which could invalidate all the work you've just done to get to this point, and maybe we'll lose the job anyway? It's like, uh, do we have to? Because I nearly died getting to this point. Do I really have to test this? And so the fear that, that testing it might actually expose the fact that the original idea was wrong is horrifying. And that's, that's a human condition. It just doesn't matter what the organisation is. And the same applies in the startup. The startup are kind of thinking, well, I've quit my job, I've maxed out my credit card, I really want this software, I believe in it, and if I'm wrong, I'm screwed. And I'd rather not find that out right now. I'd rather wait till I'm really screwed to find that one out. Yeah. And that's really kind of the difference. In both cases, there's this horrible fear of being wrong, 
and not trying to accept the possibility that it might be you could you could be wrong, and just kind of putting your hand in your heart and just believing in yourself and hoping that will get you through. And so the I think the, the challenge is to trying to recognise that and to tease out that small bit of bit or the, the scariest bit and say, look, how about we just do a little test? And what's the smallest test we can do to start trying to to validate or invalidate or not invalidate but redirect possibly the type of inquiry or question or product we're offering here because it will save you the angst later on. Um, if, if I took, because uh, I'm a marketer, if I took a, a uh, modern marketing approach to the whole thing, there's this concept called the buyer's journey. And the buyer's journey basically says this, that the modern buyer of today will engage a supplier not at the start of their journey, but towards the end. So if you sort of think about yourself, you might want to buy a video camera. Uh, a lot of people these days won't start with the shop and ask questions. They will go online, research the options, understand what it is they might actually need, read a few blogs. Oh, no, I need that. I need this. I need that. Oh, that's interesting. So they'll consume content that talks about problems and they may associate themselves with those problems. And then look for a viable solutions, and then when they get to the point of evaluation, then they'll choose the channels in the market to evaluate. Maybe at that stage, or those just some sweeping assumptions, you might be contacted at that point, and while they're contacting you, they're contacting a few other players, give a few quotes, suss some things out. Uh, but they've already been through quite a lot of journey. So um, empathising with Nick's scenario, first they almost died going through a process. I've really gone through the process of evaluating the requirements, defending or compiling and defending the business case, securing funds and putting the file on the line. So if there was a possibility that you could present your brand much earlier, whilst they're in the stage now, hey, you need to solve big problems in your organisation before you bite off a massive chunk of three, two, two years of your life with the case and go to market. Perhaps if you could see positioning at the start of the buyer's journey, you could have a chance to influence them well before they go through business case. That's quite an aspirational thing. I don't know how you go to market at the moment. But if you did that, then you would get into a world that's similar to right now. Our objectives in the sales organization is influencing tenders before the tender comes out. That tender is really just a human process, right? Influence what they need prior. So by the time they come to market, they're already evaluating the need now. So the time you the shop comes on the scene, it's already gone through a lot of the processes that we've sort of talked about. And this, again, to, to kind of tying it back to the six simple rules, in your direct customer relationship, this is where you need to understand your customers. So if you're simply saying, okay, we're we're a development resource, we provide software development people, so give me the brief or we'll get busy with it, then you're not really understanding your customer. They're giving you a the solution they want to have solved, but you're not necessarily understanding the other problems that they are having to, to just get to the point of where we're at. And so by understanding your customer and understanding that in any context, in, in, in the description we're using here, that the customer who has gone through and the individuals, not the business, but the individual buyers who are trying to bring you on board, what have they had to go through? They've had to go through a sign-up, so they had to go through maybe a tender evaluation or just playing off one or two other things. They've had to secure funding. If you can do, if you kind of think about your business development process and think, how far up that chain do I need to help influence people? What can I do to influence them before, well before they have to fill in a business case? Then you're starting to understand your customer's needs and you're providing a solution, not to just the development problem, but to the business case of writing problem, to the how do I get sign-off problem, to the how do I justify that I should be testing this before I build something problem. Okay, And so, again, you only find that stuff out by going out and speaking with them, saying, well, guys, how do you actually get sign-off? Because I'd like to be able to help you with that eventually, but I need to understand it in the first place. And so, again, these, these simple rules can be applied in the same way internally, not just to your clients' clients. Um, and their perspective. So that's what our US offices are doing a lot more of, like validation projects, and and I think the, the US is more um, open 
to that type of work. Maybe Singapore market's a bit different. But that's exactly what you know, we're just talking about, you know, them going in at the early stages, validating the idea, coming up with different ideas, seeing where they can innovate before there's any actual, you know, brief for building software, mm -hmm. if software is the right solution. Yep. Um, yeah, but I think this, this idea is really powerful though, because by the time the customer has gone through the buyer's journey, they've got you in mind as a person that you actually want to buy it. Yeah. You, 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 it's almost as if you, you poisoned the well, if I could use that term, but you've influenced the, the, the customer. If you can influence the customer's journey, which I, now that you've put the idea in my head, I see so many organizations already doing. You know, with brand awareness and with, um, or with, with, with people putting up blogs and, and, and directing traffic to the blogs to become an authority or an expert. So that when the big person goes through this purchasing journey or the, or the buying journey, by the time that they've gone through the whole thing, whenever they go to the shop, they're asking questions or whenever they get to, 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 to you, they're asking you the questions which you have framed for them and that you already have the answers to. You know, it's almost like you know, they're ready to buy from you. It's interesting. I like that. <laughs> See, I've already started Victor Brain. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, that there are perverse motives for trying to get to a buyer before they've made a decision of what they want. Because you can see to a point of differentiation. But um, when I've seen it in the ways of it's a little bit mean, but some organisations will see certain capability or language or brands early on. So that by the time they've gone, okay, well clearly that's something that's a mandatory requirement. And no one else in the market has it because it's actually a term that's own that it re removes your competitors from the equation, which allows you to break the right. price. Right. So I think, again, I don't know you did that well, but if you kind of came up with the ability of, of seeing and the importance of Turbo Scrum, you use Turbo Scrum, and probably it's because it's better than Scrum, then if you've got these people asking for Turbo Scrum, you're the only brand that uses it right. Yes. It's a silly example, but you've got that opportunity that you need to know how to... No, I know at least one company, Microsoft, used to do this quite extensively in the 90s, and they quite possibly are still trying to do it in the enterprise market, where they would frame a business problem in terms of the solutions that they provide, and then just blast the market with that. That was their strategy for squeezing out people like Linux and, and, and uh, Netscape and the rest of all of the, 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 the go-to-market strategies that they had. I can see them having done that, you know. Um, so that people would ask, do you have an Active Directory solution for me? Uh, no, Microsoft is the guy who do Active Directory, you know, so with the year to go there. And they squeeze Netscape out of the directory business, there. not Netscape, Novell, but mm -hmm. squeeze with the directory business with the Active Directory thing. Uh, and a lot of the other technologies were similarly, which do I mention? Right? Yes. I agree that understanding the customer's problem is very important, but you also mentioned that every customer is unique and different. So, are there frameworks that we can use to better understand a customer's problem in a shorter term? Uh, like, sometimes the customer don't, don't even know what their real problem is, but they seem to have the information to lead to that uh, actual problem that we just need to help them with the structure the it's, the, it, 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 it's not meant to be flippant, but the shortest cut solution is talking to them. There's no magic wand that is any better than just talking to people. And so it's, it starts off as being one conversation, and, then you're, and the other aspect of it is you're talking to them and you're listening to them. You're not selling to them, you're not trying to pitch to them, you're not saying, ah, I know the solution you need, here it is, bang. You're simply listening to them. And you're using, what we use as really a combination of two other, I love simple questions, uh, two other simple questions to sort of probe a customer's answer. And I simply use the question, why? Based on, the, on the, using the five whys to get to a, a, um, a root cause problem. But also say, so what? So if someone says, I've got this problem. I said, well, so what? And it's meant to be a little bit aggressive to get them to say, well, hang on, the reason I have this problem is because, or, or the impact of this problem, is if I have this situation, then I start losing money, I lose customers, and boom, and you start to get a response. 
But if you have a problem that has no impact, then it has no value. It's just like, it's an irritation that you can do without. But if people start expressing their problem in terms of the impact or the cost of a particular problem, you start to get a sense of it. What's the cost if you're late to work? If you say, oh yeah, I really, I get the train, it's a bit of a drag, but if I'm a little bit late, who cares? And if I ask you, what's the cost of that to you? For some people, it don't matter. Some people might be, I just missed a business meeting, which means I didn't get the deal, which means I didn't get the raise, which means I didn't get the commission, which means I just lost my job. Hmm, getting to work on time is pretty important for that person. The impact was very high in that situation. So the combination of those two questions, again, why, 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 um, not quite like that, you let them talk as well, and asking for each one of those, so what? Or what's the impact? You can soften the words if you like to tell you to get punched in the face. But those questions I find very, very quickly start to open up the conversation with the customer um, to explore the problem that they're trying to solve. What is the why, 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 why? Five whys, yeah. It's, it's five whys. So, um, uh, what's, what's something that frustrates you? E5, E5. Yeah. Why are you wearing that jumper? Why is it cold? Why is the air pump too low? Because everybody else is hot. <laughs> Why is everyone else hot? Don't know. Because they're all trying to get multiple problems. Okay, so it's not the top five why, it's just keep asking why and do at least the problem. It does, yeah, so the principle is why, why, why. It's more like drilling down on the core, doing oh, the root cause so of the question. A lot, a lot of the game is to tell you for kids like this. And so you, you still need to listen. You can't just throw the wires in there. But they're really quite powerful to start to open up the potential problem. So a classic, uh, almost a joke, is um, the, the classic Henry Ford quote of if, if Henry Ford used to say, look, customers don't know what they're talking about. They don't speak to customers because they don't know what they want. Okay, so the Henry Ford quote essentially says, um, if I asked customers what they wanted, they would have asked for a faster horse. It's almost cliche that it's used so often. But it's used as a reason not to talk to customers. But I think it's a really good example of exactly why to talk to customers. Because I would say that the customer said, I want a faster horse. They've imagined their version of a solution to their particular problem. But I don't know what their problem is. And I said, well, why do you want a faster horse? I don't know. You, you said you want the faster horse. And depending on who they are, they'll have a different answer. If they're a doctor, they might say, look, three times this week, I've only just been able to help my patient because the, currently the horse I have is too slow. Now, okay, so the time it takes you to get from one place to another is too slow. Why? Well, and then because I've got all this baggage and stuff I have to carry. You start to learn a little bit more about the situation that customer is in. What's the impact if you're late? Well, people die and I no longer have a good reputation as a doctor, so I lose my job. Okay, it's a pretty serious implication. And so you can start to tic-tac between those questions and understand a little bit more about the, 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 the customer and understand what their pain points are. And what I found is, it's, it might sound silly, I'm gonna now refer to Sesame Street. Um, there's actually a great little skit on Sesame Street uh, talking about the, the word of the, of the day is hypothesis and journal. And what that's doing on Sesame Street, I'm not quite sure, but it's pretty awesome. Um, and it's a section on essentially teaching kids the scientific method. And they do exactly this, they ask why. So their, their hypothesis is that everyone on Sesame Street has a bath. And so the first customer you see is some guy in a bath with a perfectly placed bubble, because it's a kid's show. And yes, tick, on the journal, this person's having a bath. The next character they come across is a bird rolling around in the dirt, clearly getting dirtier. And so the, the, the scientist that was trying to disprove everything is, aha, I have a, an anti, or a, 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 um, an invalidation of our claim. And then the bird, because it's a muppet and the bird could talk, says, no, hang on, I am having a bath, I'm a bird, I have a dirt bath. And so again, by asking these questions and trying to learn things directly from the, uh, from the marketplace, 
not only do they either validate or invalidate each claim, and they go through these different variations of different bars on Sesame Street, but they learn that in this case their claim was true, that everyone in Sesame Street had a bath, but what they really learned, which is the valuable stuff, was that everyone took a bath differently. So Oscar the Grouch is having a mud bath, the bird's having a, a, a dirt bath, someone's having a real bath. So all these variants that come up. But the value of, you know, if you want to get fast learning, you can pour through data analytics and lots of stuff, and you'll find the information there, but you won't find the deeper insights that are happening on the other side of the screen. And so it's when you actually speak to people and see what people are doing that you suddenly get those wow moments. This sounds sound to me a little bit, I just have to look it up. Um, I read a book quite a while ago called Spin Selling, which is about a sales technique. I don't know if you, if you know about it. And the process sounds similar to the sort of probing that you do to actually get to the customer's pain. You expose the pain and you can properly propose mm -hmm. a good solution for it. Yep, absolutely. It's exactly the same. And so the, the, the approach we're talking about is exactly the same kind of objection handling. Except in the case of a salesperson, they've got a thing they're trying to sell, so they're trying to find an edge way in. Ah, there's a problem I can hit. Boom, I've got a solution for you. From the product management perspective, our starting point should be, I have no solution. Um, otherwise, we're just a salesperson. Not there's anything wrong with that. Um, but the, the product development and product management thinking is, I'm going to the marketplace without a solution yet. Because I could just make something and hope for the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I could just go out and make something and then try and sell it, and then I'm trying to overcome objections. But if I preempt that, if I actually make something based on the pain points that I've explored and extracted from the marketplace, and then I go to the market and go, ta-da! I've kind of shortcut the objection handling entirely, because now I've created a perfect fit for the marketplace based on the objections I've already, already taken out of the picture. And so you're right, it's exactly the same technique, except now we're kind of preempting that by developing the right product in the first place, mm -hmm. rather than trying to convince someone to buy a product they don't want at all. Yeah. I was part of a lean methodology uh, workshop kind of series where we went and talked to a lot of people to validate our projects. Yep. One of the main problems I faced was that when you're can you, like, once you get an initial idea and start working, you actually go and test your product. You always find a mix of people. There's some people who like your product, some people who don't. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there might be more people who don't like your product, but there are at least few people who like your product. But at what point do you need to decide that, you know, maybe the people who don't like the product outweigh the not, like, few people who actually like the product and it's time for us to change? Or is it like, but for every product idea you go and test, so then you definitely find one or two people who like the product idea. And it's often uh, common for people to get, you know, get tunnel vision and say, okay, this guy likes my product, so obviously there's going to be a market for this, so I'm going to just continue mm -hmm. on this guy. Do so you have any guidance on what's the minimum number of people who you like or like, anything on those lines where you know that, okay, they all like products? Okay, I've got a couple of answers to that. Firstly, if you're asking customers, do you like your product, they'll probably say yes, because they like you, and they don't want to upset you. So it may or may not be the way you actually frame it on the day, but if you're asking customers, do I like it, then chances are they'll, they'll be nice to you and say yes. Um, what you really want to find out is, does this help you achieve your goal? And so part of that of understanding of your customers is understanding what their goals are, and part of our definition of a problem is anything that's stopping me achieving my goal or slowing me down or creating friction. So if you present a product to somebody and they use it and it helps them achieve their goal better, they might say, look, I don't like the shading you've got there on the, the whatever it is, but yeah, it was pretty good. I was able to do what I wanted to do. Then you're heading in the right direction. So I think framing what you're trying to validate is actually really important. If you say, do you like this design? and they say, no, I hate it, you've probably found out that they don't like your design, but it doesn't mean they won't use the product. I mean, Craigslist is a really good example of a product that's ugly as hell, yet it's cheap and does the job really well for a very large market. They couldn't care less what it looks like, because it does a job. This is where like, low fidelity prototype comes in, because you don't want to test you know, what, what code it is or 
how shiny it looks, it's just an important problem. So you want to keep it as low fi as possible. So you know, people don't really comment on visuals or you know, the shape of color or something like that. Yeah. So, so for me, early kind of prototype testing is less about an opinion and more about a stopwatch. It's about, hey, you've got a task to do. Um, if you ask, if you, you know, because but you've selected that person because they're likely to be doing that task, um, show me how you'd use this interface, whether it's a piece of paper, a PowerPoint deck, or a fully interactive um, prototype. Show me how you'd achieve that goal. Go. And if they start working through it, and then you know, potentially compare that to, a, to another alternative, if they go through it and they find they got through it faster and achieved their objective, didn't feel stupid, felt good at the end of it, then it's going to be a better outcome. I don't care if they liked it, did they get their job done? You worry about like versus not like, the very last stages of it. Because yeah. if anything that helps, I don't like Uber. I think their management and their approach to data privacy is awful. When I think about getting a cab, I think cab queue, <laughs> button that goes, bring car to me. I think, you know what? I'm going to weigh it up, bring car to me. And it's because it solves a better problem in the marketplace than the competing alternatives. So there's, there's this tool, the hypothesis statement. And so we believe that by doing this thing, we will solve this problem and we will know we've achieved success when we reach this. Mm -hmm. KPI. I think that's goes something like that, right? And that's a good way to look at you know, everything we do, like even on a story level, right? Every feed, like all these principles can be applied to individual stories, right? I mean, it's like, oh, you know, who's it for? What problem is it solving? And normally, or a lot of the time, it's just an assumption. Someone's like, oh, okay, this is a good idea. Let's just do this, right? We're building some story, but to understand like why it's there and who the problem uh, is for. And what it's uh, solving, that, that can be used in anything, no matter how small. I mean, even like writing a document or like a mission statement or a, you know, a, you know, anything. I mean, all these principles apply. It doesn't have to be on like the really top level product ideas. Yeah. Like it filters right through to every sort of you know daily task. I mean, yeah, I mean, some of these principles are used today a number of times. You know what I mean? It's, I think I think I think a user story is a really good example. Because quite often user stories get written more as a feature story, not as a user story. In fact, I like to say, if you haven't met the user, you can't write the user story. You're banned. Um, so people are writing the user story without actually having met the customer, had sort of real uh, information from a customer. It's just made up stuff. It doesn't make it wrong, but it certainly doesn't make it right. The customer makes it right. And so customer first, problem before solution, is what a user story is all about. Um, leave the building. Find out whether you're in fantasy land or the real world by, by testing your, your assumption around the user story. Um, uh, link your actions to strategic intent. If you have a user story that you think, well, that's interesting, but it's not going to help the business, then it probably shouldn't be on the backlog. Okay? Or it should be lower in the backlog than other, other user stories. And do this more often, or well, the idea of having stories that are relatively small so you can do them, do them more regularly. And of course, ultimately, show and tell. Don't just show the rest of the team show the user that you thought was the core of the user story and get them to validate that the, that the outcome, the definition of done, has been achieved. If there's, if there's going to be an acceptance criteria, it's their acceptance that should be the criteria of, of the user story, um, in addition to any technical or, or regulatory or any other sort of internal requirements that are necessary. Does that help? I have a ton of questions, I can keep talking for ages, but I think um, we probably need to wrap it up. Cool. I guess. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. And if you want to stay in touch with us, here's different ways of connecting with us. Um, certainly follow us on Twitter. Um, and if nothing else, follow the hashtag product management, PRODMGMT, to get all your product management goodness. But Polo anyway. Did you guys make that tag? No. It, it's, it's sort of been, it took a while for it to land on there because product management kind of filled up almost 140 characters straight away. Yeah. And there's sort of product uh, MKTG, I think, much for product management. I use that for this stuff. Yep. Yeah. Cool, cool. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.